Hey everybody, uh, this is Alex <clears throat> and I'm doing a podcast episode on uh, tail recursive functions meant for beginners. And in doing so, I hope we'll also discover the zen of functional programming. So, let's get started. Um, we'll first um, define a simple uh, recursive uh, function. So let's start with one for calculating the length of a list. Um, list is a recursive data structure, so we can use that as our sample. Um, for defining it recursively, we can say if the list is empty, uh, then the length is zero. Otherwise, the list can be decomposed into a head and a tail, head being the first element of the list, tail being the rest of the elements. And if that's the case, we can calculate the length of the tail and then add one to it. Now, we don't actually care about the head here. So this is um, a mathematically correct definition. It's how you would define it in math. It works for a simple example. Now let's uh, define a really long list. Let's say one, a list that has 100,000 elements. Now, in this case, we have an issue. Uh, the function is uh, throwing a Stack Overflow error, and this is bad. Uh, stack Overflow error, it means uh, that the call stack, uh, the capacity of the call stack was reached. This is a memory error. Uh, this happens because the environment <coughs> at each step uh, in that processing has to first calculate the length of the tail and then it has work to do. It needs to add one to that result. It, ne uh, it needs to use the call stack in order to do it. And this means that the call stack is growing in relation to the input. So um, if the um, list is, uh, has 10,000 elements in it, then the call stack will, uh, will also grow to 10,000 elements because um, it, it, uh, the function is to make 10,000 calls, uh, 10,000 rec recursive calls, and the bigger the list, the more, uh, the bigger the call stack, and at some point it will blow up. So <coughs> I'm going to teach you one trick to turn um, such uh, recursive functions into tele-recursive ones. Tele-recursive meaning that the compiler can optimize it into a plain while loop such that we, don't, we no longer have uh, stack overflow errors. But first, let's define the dirty version that we would define in Scala. Uh, in, Sc in, in Java, sorry. So in Java, we would have a count uh, as a defined as a variable starting from zero. We would have a cursor <coughs> with which we go over the list, uh, starting from our initial list. Now we would say while cursor is not the empty list, uh, we would increment our count at each step and we would um, say that the cursor needs to become the tail of that of our uh, list and eventually when the cursor becomes the empty list when the when nil is reached we can uh, return our count and we can see that um, this um, a function uh, right now is memory safe. It works correctly for both the um, simple uh, list and for the really big list. <coughs> but how about defining it as a tele-recursive function that doesn't use any vars at all? And of course it's possible. You can turn any while loop into a tele-recursive function and vice versa because they are perfectly equivalent. <coughs> um, and the trick in to do that is to define um, uh, another function where the variables become function parameters. So we, we have got two variables that have our state and we are going to turn these into function parameters. So we've got a cursor that's um, our current list and we've got a count that's an int and finally we are going to return an int. Now, what are the conditions here? Uh, first of all, we are checking if the uh, cursor is uh, empty. So let's check that first. But we are going to do it with a pattern matching instead, like we did the first time, case nil. 
And in case the cursor uh, is empty, is the empty list, uh, we can see here that in the while loop version we are returning count. So let's return count here as well. Now in case we have a, uh, an unempty list, we can, we can say that we've got a head and tail composition. <coughs> and we can deconstruct that. We can ignore the head because we are not using it. Now in this case, what are we uh, doing? We uh, increment the count and we evolve our cursor. So we are going to do just that with a tail recursive call. Um, we are going to say loop where the cursor becomes the tail and the count becomes count plus one. We can get rid of the dirty version right now and we call this with our initial parameters. And it works. I mean, it still works. Uh, and if you are going to um, notice, this version is exactly equivalent to the while loop. And the Scala compiler can optimize this into a regular while loop, uh, into a version that is perfectly equivalent to our while loop uh, that you saw before. And in order to ensure that the Scala compiler really does that, because this is very error prone, we can use a tail rec annotation right from Scala annotation tail rec. Uh, in doing so, the compiler checks that the function is actually tail recursive because if we do a mistake like this, then it's going to throw an error. Uh, could not optimize tail rec annotated, annotated method loop. It contains a recursive call not in tail rec position. And this is important because tail recursivity here is a matter of correctness. I mean, the, this algorithm doesn't work in case we uh, try to calculate the uh, length of a really large list. So um, that's the trick. You turn uh, variables into function parameters. But let's um, do a more complex example to really internalize this. Let's do um, a function that calculates the nth element of a Fibonacci sequence. We are going to uh, return um, big int, big int here, because um, Fibonacci numbers can be really large, uh, get large quite fast. So we are going to say this: if n equals zero, then we return zero. Else, if n <coughs> Let's do like this. So if n equals 1, then we return <coughs> 1. Else uh, we return Fibonacci n minus 1 plus Fibonacci of n minus 2. Let's see that it works. Fibonacci 0, Fibonacci 1, Fibonacci 2, Fibonacci 3, 4, Fibonacci 5. And uh, as a safety check, Fibonacci 10,000. Hmm? Okay, this one is going to fail. Cancel, cancel. <coughs> yeah. So 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5. That looks correct. But in case we try to do a Fibonacci 10,000, it's not going to work. Why? Because um, it's going to trigger our stack overflow error that you saw before. Let's cancel that. So um, let's define this as a dirty function li like we do in Java with a while loop. Um, we would start from two variables. So this would be um, x0, this would be uh, the second element x, let's not do a, b, mm. no, I like a, b, because it points to a sort of sequence. Um, and we also need a counter to see how many elements we've got left to process, starting from n, and we are going to go towards 0. Now, we, when doing such uh, while loops, we mustn't forget to do something with our um, index. 
uh, to have an exit condition, otherwise the loop is going to run forever. And we are going to say A equals B, uh, B equals A plus B, but this isn't correct because we are mutating the value of our A's. An eternal problem of our variable, an eternal problem when doing uh, mutable, uh, <coughs> mutable uh, imperative programming. So we are going to use a temporary uh, value and then we are going to uh, for storing a and here b becomes temp plus b yeah so this should be correct and eventually we are going to return our b so one one two three five eight uh, well um i want to let's do a trick here because i want uh, fi um, when n equals zero i want it to return zero so we are going to say if n is positive then 1 else 0 um, and here we are going to go until uh, 1 yeah yeah so 0 1 1 2 3 5 this looks correct <coughs> oh here we need to use uh, begins sorry about that so begin big int <clears throat> yeah, so this is correct right now. Now, let's apply the same trick. <clears throat> let's define an internal uh, inner function called loop again and turn these uh, three variables that have our state into functional parameters. So we've got an A of type big int, we've got a B of type big int, and we've got a y of type int and we are finally going to return a big int great now what are we going to say here um, if uh, y uh, for as long as y greater than one so this means that we need conditions for uh, n equals zero so if n equals zero we are going to return zero if n equals one we are going to return b else if n equals 1 is going to return p else um, we are going to do a tail recursive function but let's see about the parameters so we are going to do precisely the logic in this while loop a becomes b uh, b becomes a plus b uh, and we subtract 1 from y. And then we are going to call our loop with our initial value. So we start from 0, 1, and e equals n. Let's see what happens. Yeah, uh, the results are still correct. Uh, no, what the heck? Oh, ah, no, infinite loop, infinite loop. Ooh, I made a mistake. Yeah. Okay, now it works. Cool, and it yields the same results, apparently. So that's the trick. Basically, you turn uh, variables into function parameters. Um, we can also do a more complicated example because uh, some algorithms really are recursive. I mean, we um, some algorithms cannot be turned into simple while loops. Uh, what defines a recursive algorithm? The actual use of a of a stack uh, for keeping state. So um, let's uh, let's uh, you know. What would be such an algorithm? Well, uh, we could define uh, a tree as a data structure. We could have a data structure tree like case class node that has a value in it and then has a left node and a right node link. We could define this as a case object extends 
3 nothing and this one extends 3a right and we could define a function called fold tree that takes a tree uh, of a and a seed and a function that works with um, takes uh, the the current state of um, the, our current state and uh, the current uh, value and does something with it and the, the result will eventually be uh, you know R oh it's too long it's too long great <coughs> so we could pattern match it first of all case empty in case it's empty we return the seed because we've got nothing else to do in case it's a node we've got a value we can work with and the left and the right right so we can apply our uh, fold for the left side left hand side so <coughs> we could have a left result let's say by applying fold tree uh, to the left and as seed we are going to use um, we are going to apply our, our f function to, s to our current seed and value and then um, we can do another fold tree on the right side starting from our left result yeah and f so the result uh, of our um, left side becomes the seed for our uh, for the processing of the right side of our tree right and this algorithm is using the uh, call stack but even if you wanted to um, turn it into a plain while loop and you can do that just that you still need a stack only it's going to be a manually managed stack so you would basically work with um, loop where you would take a stack you can model a, st a stack as a list in Scala um, of um, a stack of uh, three nodes and uh, the current state as R and this one would return an R, right? So this is basically our state and what are we going to do? Well, if the stack is empty, we return our current state. Otherwise, if we've got a node, um, if we've got an empty node, we are going to ignore it. Or otherwise, if, we, if we've got um, a value we can work with, it means we've got a left and a right. And we are going to do our tail recursive call. And right now the stack is going to evolve. We are going to push in our stack left, right and the tail. So th our stack will grow right now. And then we are going to apply our function to uh, the state and the current uh, value. Um, right, it's not correct, so tail, we've got a tail missing here, right? So we can apply our loop to list and our initial seed. So right now this is a correct definition and we can um, we can check that the function is tail rec right and it really is 
However, notice that we actually have a stack in this algorithm because it's a recursive algorithm. Why? Because it's a recursive uh, data structure. Our tree is a recursive data structure. And uh, uh, I mean, it's um, and it's not a list. List is also a recursive data structure, but list can be um, uh, folded with a tail recursive algorithm. But this tree here, this binary tree here can't. So it, we actually need a stack to traverse it, to uh, fold it. And this will uh, show up in the algorithm, but it's still a while loop, right? Uh, um, only the stack is manually managed. What, what this buys you in practice, by the way, is that you can work with a bigger uh, stack because the, the call stack of uh, the JVM is limited. Um, and um, right now with a while loop like this, described like this, you can work with a stack that takes up the entire cap memory you have. Um, so we, you can work with bigger inputs. It will, the, um, the stack will still grow in relation to the, the depth, depth of that tree, uh, but uh, um, you can at least work with larger trees. Also, when, when you traverse a tree, you also um, have a choice in how you traverse it. So you, you, if you take a look at uh, algorithm books, you'll, you'll see a distinction between breadth first and depth first um, traversal. This is actually, um, I think it's a depth first, this one. The breadth first uses a Q or something, yeah. So uh, this is it. and. What about the Zen of functional programming? Well, in functional programming, you don't mutate um, variables, you don't mutate uh, memory. What you do in functional programming is that you evolve um, function parameters via function calls. So it's a function composition where the state is evolved by evolving the uh, function parameters. So <laughs> something to think about. Um, that's it. I hope you found this uh, useful and um, <laughs> see you next time.